Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Delta Dialogues, your monthly call for the integrated photonics community. My name is Johan Smeets, and I'll be your host. Today, we're calling in live from MIT campus at Cambridge in the United States of America, where we just concluded a three-day session for the IPSR International. The IPSR stands for Integrated Photonic Systems Roadmap, and this is a global industry roadmap that Photon Delta, together with MIT, coordinates. Over 400 different volunteers contribute to the roadmap and take part in two physical meetings per year. And the spring meeting always takes place in MIT campus. So, over the past three days, we had discussions that were all focused on one theme, sustainability. How can we sustainably scale the industry? What are the challenges we need to address? And, and, and how can we work together to overcome those? Over the past days, over 100 people gathered in this room behind me and discussed on these matters. We figured that both electronics and photonics really need to join forces in road mapping activities. Today's program includes four different speakers. We're going to start with an introductory interview with Peter van Arkel. Peter van Arkel is the road mapping director of the IPSR International at Berenschot. After Peter, we are going to talk with Lionel Kimmerling, who is Thomas Law Professor at the MIT and also director of the MIT Microphotonics Center. Professor Kimberling is going to talk to us about the, this technology scaling and recap the sessions of the past three days. After Professor Kimberling, we're going to listen to Sejan. Sejan is Education Director at the ICOM Institution here at the MIT. Our last speaker, Anu, is going to talk about ecology. She's a principal researcher here at MIT. So, Peter, we've had a very interesting three days here at the IPSR International, uh, the 2023 spring meeting at the MIT campus where we are standing now. Um, can you uh, tell us a bit more about what is the IPSRI actually? Yeah, of course. So, the IPSRI is a uh, community of more than 400 experts from around the globe. Uh, who are looking for the integrated photonics technology where it should be in the future. So 5, 10, 15 and 20 years are really making it, thinking of how the future will look like for integrated photonics and what are the paths to do so. And why we're doing that is because we really want to drive volume manufacturing of integrated photonics, mm -hmm. yep. uh, and which will enable us to achieve the sustainable development goals. And here we have uh, the application uh, guides that are six application areas from agro-food to datacom, uh, automotive, etc. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, module chapters that are looking on how you can combine different integrated photonic technologies to really achieve a photonic function. Mm -hmm. So think, for example, of 3D imaging, imaging yeah. for LiDAR, or think about uh, the transceivers, mm -hmm. or our photonics for 6G applications, or even 7G uh, wireless communication. Uh, and now we have the technology chapters. That's really what's going into the mix for, for these modules. So that is uh, back-end technologies, test assembly packaging, that are the different front-end platforms, heterogeneous integration, and also, of course, the, the design software, which you cannot go without if you really want to plot the future for integrated photonics. Mm -hmm. uh, and how we've done this, the, the process that we're following is these um, 400 experts. This community is uh, uh, separated in different working groups. Each okay. chapter has its own working group. And they meet every now and then online, once needed, to uh, work on the chapter and to evaluate what's in there and to come up to a new publication, which we'll do in 2023, mm -hmm. at the end of this year. And furthermore, we have four meetings a year, or four meetings for each publication, uh, where we meet in a setting like this, mm -hmm. where we have uh, 100 to 200 people participating and really discussing in breakout sessions where the future of the integrated photonics technology should be. All right, great. So, um, last uh, version of the IPSRI was published in 2020, right? Correct. So, is there a lot of things that are going to change uh, in the upcoming uh, version in terms of the structure of the roadmap? Yeah, so we maintain mainly the, the, the structure of the roadmap as it was, mm -hmm. uh, although in the application uh, chapters we're going to make them application guides, mm -hmm. so having uh, less technical content and really putting that into the modules. So for example, where previously automotive chapter would go into depth on LiDAR, it will now just guide you through the roadmap, okay, what does 
uh, what topics do you need for automotive? And then they refer to the 3D imaging where the LiDAR is a part of. And the same goes, for, for, for example, for interconnects that you can use within a car to connect different devices there. Okay, so that's going to make it easy for the reader to go and find the things that they're looking for. Yes, in, exactly. In the chapters. Okay. Yeah. And so we were here with a lot of experts coming from different angles of the globe. We had people coming from Japan, uh, Korea, we're coming from the States, from Europe as well. A uh, mix of, I think, academia, industry, photonic companies, what you said, software developers. Um, what are the most important things that you learned over the past three days? Yeah. So what my main takeaway is, is that the future of, um, of integrated photonics uh, has many applications that could be driving innovation. Uh, and that goes further than the te datacom telecom market, which has previously been the main driver. Mm -hmm. But if we really look to 2040, 2045, we see many applications like the uh, 3D imaging, like our photonics with all the wireless uh, connections uh, that might be driving. And this is good news for the industry. Uh, because it, it, this multiplies the market by manifold. Mm -hmm. So where we previously focused mainly on datacom, this means that we now also have a big 3D imaging market and we can have a big uh, aerophotonics market, so the, the, the wireless communications. And that may, means that we only can um, progress industry further and integrated photonics. And also, I guess, allow for a lot different technologies, different players to enter into those various markets, right? Yes, yes. It's not a, uh, it looks like it will not be a one platform takes all market. Mm -hmm. the, each platform, uh, each technology platform has its own advantages and disadvantages mm -hmm. and for the different applications areas you can use different technologies. So there will be something for almost everybody, yeah, yeah. is my prediction. Yeah, the pie will be big enough. And the pie will be big enough, okay. yeah. Uh, so you just mentioned that 2040, 2045, looking really far ahead in the future and saying, well, there's going to be plenty of different applications where integrated photonics is going to play a role. Um, if you bring us a little bit more forward to let's say the near future or today, what, what do you think is, uh, what are the, the, the applications besides data telecom, which everyone knows about, of course, that are already happening? So the applications that are already happening mm -hmm. in integrated photonics, yeah. uh, what you see is biophotonics, bio uh, and chemical sensing coming up for uh, all kinds of different um, uh, materials or gases or liquids that you really want to sense. Uh, for example, in the Netherlands, we have nitrogen uh, measurements that is now a big deal due to the uh, pollution of the uh, of the nature we have, mm -hmm. or methane, for example, which is a big polluter on uh, uh, on the greenhouse gases. Yes. Uh, so you see a really upcoming market there, and uh, if you follow market reports, uh, biophotonics is really one of the big uh, possibilities that mm -hmm. we have. Okay, um, I think. You mentioned at the beginning that uh, the, also the goal of the roadmap is to, let's say, accelerate the scaling to higher volumes. Um, what are uh, the biggest challenges that were discussed in the past days on scaling to volume? Yeah, so for, um, for the interconnect, it's mainly price. In uh, 2045, we predict that there will be uh, 43 billion interconnects. And at the price of one dollar each, it will be a huge market on its own just for the interconnect. Mm -hmm. This is not sustainable. This will not be scalable. So we really need to do something about the, the, the price point mm -hmm. of it. And um, well, that can be achieved with more volume. So mm -hmm. it's a bit of a chicken egg uh, question. Like if you have more volume, then you can go down in your prices. Mm -hmm. And if you, uh, well, and vice versa. Yeah. Um, I think also one of the things that someone was mentioning, or more people, I think, is about the packaging, the back end of the, of the, of the process. Uh, there's, uh, let's say, to how to integrate the various technologies together. It's also yeah. one, of the, one of the challenges, I think, where we have to deal with, right? Yeah. 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 So you have uh, the onboard optics, for example, or co-package optics. Co uh, that might be one of the solutions also for this heterogeneous integration that you mentioned, where different uh, technologies go into one chip. Mm -hmm. uh, and this can be either electronic uh, chips or photonic chips, or uh, prefer preferably both. But it can also be photonic chips from different materials, for example, active lasers from indium phosphide, mm -hmm. and then a silicon nitride platform, for example. So, uh, yeah, the packaging for these new combinations, really in one package, that's something we need to t tackle in the future. Yeah. So, uh, the theme of the uh, conference uh, of the spring meeting was sustainability. Um, how PICs can contribute to a more sustainable future. Can you elaborate a little bit more on, on that? 
Yeah, of course. Uh, so the uh, the contribution of integrated photonics that it can uh, do to the sustainable development goals, for example, for the United Nations, but also sustainability in general, uh, are in potential very big. Uh, for example, for the healthcare market, by integrating these photonics devices, you can make these big devices that you now use in hospitals. You can make the handheld device or something that can work with your phone even. Mm -hmm. And then you can make it more affordable and also more accessible to communities who don't have access to these expensive materials. So that's a benefit for health, but also if you look at the expectation that data centers will use about 20% of our energy production in 2030 if we don't do anything. So the as-is situation, integrated photonics, by using more efficient ways of uh, transferring data, mm -hmm. uh, can reduce this number by 80%. Mm -hmm. So you will ha only have still 4% of the total energy consumption left. And that way you really reduce the impact that you have on the environment compared to alternative technologies. Um, but there's also uh, the benefits to infrastructure. It's a more safer environment. Think about infrastructure, your um, um, traffic lights, that can talk with cars and can talk with each other, autonomous cars maybe even, because probably they'll be driving better than tired people. Uh, sure. So you can really uh, make them more efficient. They can uh, be, be a more efficient means of transport, uh, but also make the, the, it much safer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that way there are multiple uh, application areas where integrated photonics really can drive uh, sustainability. And this impact compared to others uh, we've heard today in a, a, a lecture is that's called the um, handprint rather than the footprint, which is uh -huh. the, like the, the downside, the cost that you have. And integrated photonics has this. We don't have to, to put this away, right? Integrated photonics does have uh, a footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, so it needs all kinds of materials that will be processed. It will need uh, energy, of course, that goes into it, water. Um, and then we also have the recycling uh, issue. Where is it going to end up and how is it going to get back in the supply chain for mm -hmm. full circularity? Mm -hmm. uh, and we also decided uh, that we really want to look into this as a photonic, integrated photonics community. Okay, what are the things we see in the future when we're scaling up that could really be uh, driving our footprint, so the, the negative side? Mm -hmm. And um, that way we can improve what we do well, so mm -hmm. the, the handprint, yep. and reduce the, the footprint. footprint. And I think personally that we have to look in the future, okay, how are this heterogeneous integration we mentioned, mm -hmm. how if you are going to stack all these layers and do the packaging, yep. what are materials we should definitely not use and already think of a different solution. So we're not investing in things that are not sustainable right. at all. And do it right from the start. Exactly. Yeah. We should think about it now and we should ask academia also to be involved yep. to look in the future, okay, if we're going to develop this what does that mean and can we prevent it already before it even happens? Okay, great. Thank you very much, Peter. And so, um, Beringschot is helping us, uh, Photon Delta and MIT, to coordinate the roadmap and to take, take care of that. Um, but let's say if, if someone is watching and they, and they want to join uh, one of the working groups, how, how does that work? Can people join? Is it open for contribution or? Yes, all experts in integrated photonics can join. It's a highly technical forum, so we're really looking for technical experts. Um, and you can join, you can send an email uh, to me personally, uh, which you can find on the IPSI website also, mm -hmm. which is photonicsmanufacturing.org. Mm -hmm. press, press the go back button and <laughs> dial it back slowly, then you'll uh, know it. Yeah. It's photonicsmanufacturing.org. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you can also send an email to Photon Delta. And uh, if you say that you want to join the IPSI, I'm sure it will uh, reach us yes. and you will be invited. Please also let us know which working group you want to join because mm -hmm. we have the, the technologies, the modules and the applications. Right. Then we can put you in contact with the right working group leaders. Okay, great. And I think um, just to conclude, now was the spring meeting. We mentioned uh, that uh, we have twice per year we do a meeting, right? The next one is going to be in November. All right. uh, we'll be taking place in Eindhoven on the 7th and 8th and the 9th of November. Um, so uh, you can go to picksummiteurope.com uh, in order to register yourself and also take part in those uh, IPSRI workshops. Yeah, so that is indeed at Pax Major we have one of the discussion fora where we're going to look at the uh, crossovers between different technologies and do the validation before we do the publication of the roadmap. So if you still want to have your input and help us validate the roadmap, please join us and uh, I hope to see you all there. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. You're welcome, thank you. You know, we had a terrific meeting. 
uh, one of the uh, key things that impressed all of us was how we were so interested in working together in the, the future and collaborating on taking the IPSRI from a photonics centered activity to one that's more centered on the electronics industry as a whole, as well as being centered on ecology and workforce preparation as well. Uh, it's pretty easy to look at the technology challenges and realize that now is a time of terrific change. Uh, we could say it's a technology transition or better yet a transformation into something into the future that's going to be uh, enabled by the full integration of photonics and integrated photonics into uh, all sorts of ICT applications. Uh, you, you need only think about uh, the advance of video. So to get to 16K high definition video from user to user uh, or streaming applications, uh, the estimate is one terabit per second to the home. And here we are arguing over 100, gig, 100 megabits per second. Uh, that's, we're really proud of that, but scaling that by 10,000 is, is quite a challenge. How are we going to do that, and how are we going to do that to large numbers of people without uh, amplifying the energy cost of doing that is, is one of our challenges. If, if you think about the real component challenges, it's really right now packaging. Uh, we, we're not going to make chips that much differently. Even if transistors get a little bit smaller, uh, it's not going to change that much. Uh, but the real challenge is how do we get different chips to interact with one another so that the package can create functionality. For instance, processors and accelerators, uh, CPUs, GPUs, for example, and also photonic uh, interconnection to the outside uh, for the I.O. Uh, we don't know how to do that yet. Uh, it's very rudimentary hybrid approaches now, uh, but the future is going to be fully integrated onto interposers, uh, probably glass interposers, and uh, and you know even though glass has been the foundation for fiber, uh, planar glass is, has no technology that we can use to apply now. So uh, figuring out how to do that and how to make the interconnection from a package to the outside with high O bandwidth up to petabits per second, uh, if you like, is a real challenge. And it's one that can't be uh, surmounted by copper wires to the outside. And even copper wires on the inside are going to become impossible when you start dealing with these high data rates. So uh, the package. Uh, we heard several talks here at the meeting that package technology is over 25 years old and we're still using it and uh, that it's not, not only not effective but it's not scalable to where we need to go. So uh, that challenge is going to be very important. Um, when uh, we think about networks, uh, we're increasing the data capacity in networks greater and greater and greater. We heard at this meeting uh, from uh, one of the companies, uh, their uh, product to scale to 800G uh, as far as the uh, transmission within the network uh, has to be done with no digital signal processor. Not only does the DSP consume energy, but it introduces latency, and that can't be tolerated. Uh, so the only way they can get the signal integrity that's required is to go with photonics everywhere rather than use copper wires. So that's going to be an interesting transition and a major redesign uh, as far as how it's going to be done and implemented at the, at the greater network level. Um, I, th I think if we, if we look forward into uh, where we're expecting to get in, in the future, uh, we realize that the roadmap is going to be very important. Uh, with so much change happening, uh, it needs to be done by consensus, otherwise we have such fragmentation of solutions that uh, the supply chain can't cope with the, uh, the needs of the different ways of doing things. So it's going to be very important for all of us to get together and uh, both on Today we call it the electronics side and the photonics side. Tomorrow, uh, hopefully, maybe day after tomorrow, we'll be calling it just the IC industry. And we'll all be part of the same thing. We'll be expecting that the photonics side will be giving up its large margins in order to get high volume 
and low manufacturing costs and, uh, and make up for that with uh, the high volume production rather than low volume production and high margins. It's, it's going to happen anyway, whether you're part of it or not. And I would advise you not to get left out of that uh, transition. So it was a great meeting. Uh, I've never encountered a group that uh, was so dedicated to working together, uh, has had such a shared vision of where they needed to go. And I'm looking forward to being part of the future. Thank you. Um, so, Sejan, one of the three most important um, themes of the conference it was about workforce development. Um, we've had an interesting past couple of days. Uh, what uh, struck you most? Well, I, I would say, Jorna, what really has, uh, has impressed me uh, in the conversation over the last couple of days is that um, workforce training has to be uh, incredibly uh, rapid iteration right now. It has to be uh, a moving target in essence. Mm -hmm. uh, and really it's for, uh, for two reasons. One is already very well known, which is that the, the integration of photonics with electronics is, uh, is still seeking out its standards. Mm -hmm. And so best practices, um, design standards, uh, even fabrication uh, standards, all of those, that training has to be continually updated. And uh, thus far in the education work that we've done, we've tried to do that with online courses or short courses which can be rapidly uh, updated. But what really impressed me uh, at this conversation was the new emerging discussion about sustainability, mm -hmm. uh, specifically environmental sustainability and its role in workforce training has implications where there is going to be a lot of very, very fast training that needs to be updated and Equally important, I would say, for both the, um, the veteran incumbent engineer uh, as well as the new incipient workforce, the people in university, the people going into community college careers, and uh, the kinds of skills that we have to really define to develop uh, a new kind of green curriculum in manufacturing specific to photonics mm -hmm. has very little points of reference to build off of right now. So there's literally, there's some blind guesswork here, working from other industries and their kind of extant practices, uh, and then rapidly uh, correcting course. So really what's needed is highly modularized education, whether it's hands-on, very, very short boot camp type training that can be rapidly upgraded, very, very fast online education tools, and a lot of interactive thing, which is something we've started to explore with um, these kinds of virtual reality simulations and game-based learning tools. Uh, this really, I think, is, uh, is the path forward for the industry to really get itself uh, skilled and, um, and reach a kind of a consensus level of expertise. All right. Interesting. So, yeah, using different new methodologies also, the use of what you said, AR, whatever, to um, get these um, people trained and ready for the industry um, as we are expecting and a big increase. It's emerging. Um, so what uh, do you think is needed in terms of collaborations? You mentioned that we need to maybe work on existing things that are already out there from other industries and how we can combine that. Uh, what, what, what do you think needs to be done there? So I think that um, a, lot, uh, a lot is to be uh, learned, I would say, from um, other adjacent electronics industries mm -hmm. yeah. and um, insights emerging from uh, something like the solar cell industry, which, which inherently requires large volume manufacturing. And so I think there's some emerging insights there that, uh, that we can uh, take um, within a new kind of curriculum mm -hmm. to begin to think through here. Um, but then also uh, really looking at um, the um, manufacturing standards reported by FABS, mm -hmm. which um, folks from SEMI and INEMI were talking about mm -hmm. uh, over the last three days over yeah. here. Yeah. To really look at that and to begin to identify where, uh, number one, um, an advocacy can be put forward in the roadmap work. Recommendations to really right. think about how to dial back on PFAS consumption, for example. And, um, and if really um, we might, such as what the Texas Instruments speaker uh, spoke about here, uh, yeah. think about working at a slightly larger technology node yeah. uh, for particular application-specific PICs and ICs. Mm -hmm. um, that, in turn, has an implication for the kinds of skilling. Are we wanting yeah. to teach engineers about extended UV or not, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, so all of this has a lot of interconnection. And um, really, I think where it begins with is... Um, 
the people who've come here to continue a road mapping effort with them mm -hmm. to identify what are these recommended norms and then proactively start to build education content towards that. Right, okay. So leveraging what's already there and especially with the microelectronics industry where yes. there's a lot of things that have already been done and put in place and how can we utilize that for the emerging photonics industry. All right, thank you very much. Um, so we're talking about, I guess, a couple of different challenges, right? So it's about also getting new people to join in the industry. It's about educating people from the start and motivating them to join or to at least choose a career maybe within the integrated photonics or, well, uh, Lionel was saying it's a, the IC industry then, huh? yeah. hopefully in the future when That's things right. merge. Yeah. Um, uh, and and, and, and what, what do you think could be um, uh, something we can do there as well? So I think that... Um Without a doubt, without a doubt, uh, a lot of work uh, needs to be put forward to uh, communicate the value and the excitement of this technology, right. um, really at the middle school and the high school level, mm -hmm. to, to use the American parlance. Yep. So from uh, seventh grade, eighth grade onwards, uh, it is to really to capture the imagination of that next generation workforce, whether they are people who are heading on trajectories into uh, vocational technology schools or community colleges or universities mm -hmm. that are researched here. Uh, it is really to get them uh, to become aware of it. As we talked about at the meeting here, uh, it, is, it is a shocking observation that mm -hmm. given the projected revenue of, uh, of these industries associated with PICs and ICs, and they're, uh, they're coming together in LiDAR applications and 6G applications. Given the enormous revenue that's being forecasted beyond 2020, it is a shock to see how few people are majoring in the kinds of disciplines that feed directly into these fields right. uh, at the university level. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the university level. What's the story at a community college? It, right. it is likely going to be even less knowledge about mm -hmm. these kinds of career opportunities. Mm -hmm. So a great deal of work needs to be done uh, in uh, making uh, really the IC uh, and its uh, technology and the PIC and uh, the marvels of its mm -hmm. technology more um, intelligible, yep. more understandable yep. to this younger learner. And I think that as it came up in the conversation on, on, uh, on day three, there's an opportunity given we're at this moment where Internet of Things is, is becoming a rather a ubiquitous engagement where mm -hmm. people are playing with drones and they're acclimated to having smarter tools, mm -hmm. um, talking to speakers and asking for music. There are opportunities to really begin to devise learning tools that get people to understand more immediately what IC chips do for them mm -hmm. and how they transform their lives. Right. Um, they no longer simply need to be this magical thing that's behind the keyboard of a laptop, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so I think there's an opportunity there to, A, not only make people aware of the computation marvels and ability mm -hmm. of ICs and the, um, the, the um, communications complexity that you get with a PIC chip, mm -hmm. but secondly, also to begin to interleave that with some kind of a sustainability consciousness. Right. That's something that, from what we've seen in our early research uh, people in their teens, early 20s, mm -hmm. are very conscious about wanting to find careers mm -hmm. that are leading to sustainable technologies. Right. And so to communicate how this industry is trying to reorient itself mm -hmm. to be cleaner, yeah. that will only help. That will help. All right. Um, so uh, we, we discussed the challenge of attracting, let's say, new entrants into the industry, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, from, from a young age. Uh, but what about um, maybe the working people already that, that want to maybe, uh, let's say, train uh, themselves so that they can enter into this industry as well, like f from the side, I would say. Uh, is they, what, what are the opportunities there? So for those kinds of uh, uh, what we would call incumbent learners right. who, are, yes. uh, who are veterans in the industry mm -hmm. at, at any point in their, um, in their maturing career, and they're looking to uh, reorient themselves with more photonics-related skills or integrated photonic skills, I think that um, it's really... Um, to take advantage of what we what we call blended learning opportunities, mm -hmm. where they can get to take some digital learning tools, online things such as short MOOCs, or these virtual reality simulators that we've right. begun to create and populate on our MOOC platform, uh, or digital games that can teach them about trade-off analysis mm -hmm. in the applications that are driving integrated photonics. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of uh, quick learning tools can start to build 
uh, for these for these uh, learners who are experts in some other field. Yep. It, it starts to give them a grasp about the boundaries of uh, photonics and what they really need to have under their belt, if mm -hmm. you will, in terms of electromagnetism and material science. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they can graduate up from that to come to a, uh, an in-person training event, whether it's the summer school that's run at MIT, um, there are similar such offerings happening in Europe as well, mm -hmm. uh, or whether they, uh, they take boot camps where they get to work right. hands-on with pick chips yep. and get to test them. Exactly. That then really rounds out their confidence and their understanding of how they can then build their education more independently going forwards. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can um, uh, look back at a very pa successful past three days, right? We had a lot of people in the room with full of energy. Is there any last um, takeaway you want to uh, share with the audience before we end our interview? I think uh, what impressed me most on the last day is really appreciating how um, while there is some legacy uh, thinking about when will photonics really become a value proposition to the microelectronics industry mm -hmm. that can't be turned away. Mm -hmm. um, understandably, in trying to replace the copper interconnect, it's, it's, uh, it is entirely understandable uh, why that still is a question where there's people on either side of the fence. However, the other big application driver areas, uh, without a doubt, really need to work on photons in tandem with electrons. So as, uh, as it came up in the conversation today, the movement towards 6G communications simply cannot happen without PICs and ICs and optical fiber, yep. right, to rely That's on RF over fiber. It, it right. can't happen without it. And with a lot of sensing, uh, gas sensing or, or uh, biological sensing opportunities, to be able to do something at scale with good enough fidelity, again, it's likely photonics is where you have to end up. Mm -hmm. So those necessary uh, combinations, partnerships of, uh, of the photonic chip with the electronic chip are inevitably here and they're coming within the next five plus years. So it's, it's really time to learn how to partner up mm -hmm. these, uh, these two industries that have their origins spaced apart in computation communications they need to learn to work together much more intimately. All right. Thank you very much, Sejan. And have a lovely weekend. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Welcome, Manu. Hi. Hi, Jorn. Nice Hi. to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, it was a lovely part of three days that we spent together here, together with all the contributors and volunteers from the IPSR International. Yes. Uh, one of the important themes that we discussed was sustainability, yes. right? And um, because we as the PIC community, of course, we already know that uh, PICs contribute to a sustainable future in the sense that it helps reduce energy consumption, yes. right, in data yes. centers, for yes. example. Um, but I think in the past few days, we've done a lot more about sustainability. And, and of course, it's one of the things that we really need to work on in order to secure you know, the, the, the livability of this planet for future generations. So maybe, can you help shine some light on the key takeaways from this conference? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, shine some light. I like yes, that. Yes. <coughs> um, so in addition to lower energy consumption, we also learned that uh, photonic integrated circuits, actually photonic electronic integrated circuits, um, are very helpful because they allow us to uh, send our photonic integrated circuits. Can You can send signals further away. They don't have to be so close to the transceivers on the chip because you don't need copper lines. You can use optical connections. And now you can move further away. When you move further away, at end of life, you can disaggregate easily because now you can pick out different parts of these components, maybe reuse them, whereas when they're all tightly connected, close to each other, then you end up putting them all into a shredder together and recovery becomes harder. Mm -hmm. So that's an added advantage of photonic, electronic integrated circuits, where photonics is helping. Mm -hmm. uh, one more thing that we learned re recently from this conference is that photonics can do with lagging nodes. We don't need advanced nodes for photonics. And with the lagging nodes, we don't need as much PFAS chemicals. So that's another big issue for sustainability of the planet, to get rid of PFAS. Yes. 
this is a regulation that's coming down the pike. Exactly. And so this is a benefit, additional benefit of photonics. And now that we know that photonic electronic integrated circuits are the way of the future for sustainable planets, why don't we also try to educate the workforce in terms of photonic integrated circuits? So, work for sustainability. All right. Thank you, Anu. Um, one of the other things that I've heard in the discussions uh, today was about the design of the chip, how that can also contribute to sustainability. Yes. Can you maybe explain a little bit? Yes, sure. Um, so, people have been talking now about thinking of circularity from the beginning. So, since electronic photonic integrated circuits are still somewhat new compared to just microelectronic circuits, we can start thinking about designing for sustainability from the start of these electronic photonic circuits. And when you design with sustainability in mind, you can think about designing such that you can repair a chip. Or if you want to upgrade your cell phone or your laptop. You don't have to throw away the entire cell phone or the whole laptop. You can just change one chip, swap it out with a new chip, and that way you have a, an upgraded device, but you have the same old product. So this way, designing for sustainability from the start will help us reduce our waste, e-waste, and therefore become more sustainable. All right. So how do you think these road mapping activities are going to contribute to let's say, reach those ambitions that we're setting for ourselves? So the, the goal of the roadmap is to proceed, um, I would say, in three dimensions simultaneously. Optimize technology performance, mm -hmm. optimize ecological or environmental benefit sustainably, and third vector is education and workforce development. So if we can proceed along all of those three vectors, simultaneously optimize along all the three, I think our roadmap will take shape in a way that's good for the planet, good for the people, and good for profits. The PPP idea. All right. Thank you very much, Anu. And thanks for the interview. It was lovely. Yeah, it was lovely right. as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>